Yesterday when we were talking about stem cell uh, technology and we were just started into this discussion about um, what's, what's wrong with harvesting uh, embryonic stem cells and um, we were uh, going to look at some scripture verses uh, that uh, of these uh, So we, I think we already looked at Psalm 139, 13 through 16. So let's look at Jeremiah um, 1, 5. Here's my analog again. And it says that, Behold, I formed you in the womb. This is uh, God talking to Jeremiah. And he says, Before I formed you in the womb. I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. So even before you were completely formed in the womb, God already knew who you were. In other words, in his, in his mind, you uh, were just as real as you are right now, even though you weren't completely formed. He did see you as different than you are right now. You're, you're still the same you that you were when you were still forming inside your mother's womb. Uh, the next one is Job 31, 15. Not 15, yeah, 15. I did read that right. Uh, it says that, Did not he who made me in the womb make them... Did not the same one form us both within our mothers? Okay. So God makes us who he wants us to be uh, in the womb. In other words, you are not an accident. You are, you know, exactly like he wanted you to be. And as a previous verse talked about, God, when he was forming you, already knew what your purpose would be here on earth. Now, sometimes that takes us a little while to figure out, you know, what is my purpose here? I just, uh, as my uh, pastor says, we're supposed to be more than converting oxygen into carbon dioxide. You know, that's, that's, we have a job that's a little bit more than just that, taking oxygen and converting it into carbon dioxide for plants. Okay, we have a lot more, a bigger purpose uh, than that. Uh, and then we have Genesis... Uh, 26 and 27. This is the one I'd like to spend a little bit more time talking about. I think you're familiar with this verse. Uh, probably maybe even talked about it in Bible class would be my guess, or Sunday school or wherever. Uh, and it says this. Then, uh, this is after God had created all the animals, all the livestock, uh, all kinds of uh, living things. He says, then God said, let us make um, man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the, the creatures that move along the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God he created him, male and female, he created them. So, first of all, when you read that verse, it says, let us. Who's the us? Yeah, the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. I mean, here's how I kind of picture it. God's the master planner. As we read in the other parts of the Bible, the actual creator is Jesus. And who was his assistant? The Holy Spirit was his assistant. Okay? So they're all involved in this process. Now, the part that I want to spend a little bit of time talking about is, uh, well, first let me say this. Male and female, whether you're a guy or a girl, you're still made in God's image. There's nothing, God doesn't make any distinction, you know, between the two. Even though mankind sometime will value man over woman, I guess there isn't some uh, cultures where women are valued more than men. They're equal in God's eyes. Okay? He made both of us. 
in different ways, but he made both of us. Now, what does it mean to be made in his image? Is God physical? Is God physical? No, he's a spirit being, right? So it obviously has nothing to do with how you look. Okay? None of us look like God because he's a spirit. So, he, so it doesn't mean that. So what does it mean then? What does it mean to be made in his image? Yes? Say it a lot, little louder. We have character traits. Okay, we, so me, being made in his image means we have character traits. So now I'd like to talk about, okay, then what are those character traits that you have that are like God? We're mini creators. Yeah, you're mini creators. Okay, it's interesting. Both um, biology classes, that was the first thing that was listed. We have creativity. God created out of... Nothing, right? Now, we always have to start with something, right? But we're creative, so we have the creative aspect of us is like God. Okay, what else? Uh, we're intelligent beings. Okay, you're intelligent. You can carry on, you can reason, think through problems. I'm always just totally amazed uh, that... Uh, you can fall asleep so quickly. No, not, not that. Uh, I'm totally amazed that uh, of what man's been able to figure out. Stuff that you can't even see, like atoms, the parts of the atoms. And, more, and we discovered there's more particles than just protons, neutrons, and electrons. Uh, how, how could man be able to figure out? Why? Because God gave us the intelligence to be able to figure these things out without him having to tell us the answer. You know, he gave us the ability to figure this out. So we're, we are intelligent beings. We can reason. What else? How else are you like God? Well, we can distinguish between good and evil. Okay, distinguish between good and evil. Now, that was kind of one of the, the tests, wasn't it, when Satan came up to Eve said, you know, you really do want to eat this food, this fruit. We don't know if it's an apple or not, but we eat this fruit because the benefit is what? You'll be wise knowing the difference between good and evil. Apparently Adam and Eve didn't know that before. Is it important that we know that necessarily, apparently? Now it is, you know, in our current state, we need to know the difference between good and evil. In the early, in the, in the pre-sin state, we didn't apparently need to know that, you know. It was, only God needed to know that, what was evil. Okay, so we know the difference between good and evil. In other words, it has to do with moral, you know, we're both moral uh, beings. He's always good, and we just aren't always good. We can only rely on God's goodness to be able to get to heaven. It's not our goodness. What else? Does God have emotions? Does it say he loves? Does it say he hates? Uh, does he uh, feel sorrow or sadness? Yeah, he has all of those. So that's so those are things that aren't part of your physical body. Those are part of you. Uh, and um, if they are part of God, then they're okay for us to exhibit those. Now, some of these we can exhibit in a wrong way. All of them, I guess, we can always exhibit in wrong ways. Uh, last night in our small group, one of the verses was, uh, be angry, but yet don't sin. In other words, anger is a good thing. What anger tells you should be telling you something's not right. Something's not right. That's the way God made us. We to identify something's not right. If something makes you angry, you know something's not right. Now, you can act on that anger in a wrong way, and that's what the Bible is telling was telling us in that verse is, you know, yet don't sin. In other words, don't let it be something that causes you to sin. But being angry is okay. 
You know, it also says how long should you be anger, angry? What, what's, what's, how long can you be angry? It says. Um, until the sun sets. Now, in other words, by the end of the day, you need to get over it. Okay, you need to get, get over it. Uh, you know, figure out how to resolve it. You know, but anger is a way. It just God's emotion within us telling us something's not right. It's not wrong to be, you know. And love, you can also love in a wrong way, right? You know, so these are emotions that God has. Now, there's more that we could go in, into, but, you know, those are some things. When God makes us in his image, these are the things that it's talking about, uh, being made in his image. Okay, now let's go on and talk about uh, maybe a more beneficial or we don't, where we don't see anything in Scripture saying this is wrong. And this would be somatic stem cells, where we take some of your cells, let's say you're suffering from a certain disease, and we take some uh, somatic stem cells, and we use them to, to kind of heal our own disease. Now, these cells came from you, so since they came from you, and we put them back into you, your body will recognize, oh, those are mine and it won't try to destroy them. If I took them from somebody else, I might have to give you some drugs to keep your body from trying to destroy the very thing I'm trying to help you with, you know? So, anti-rejection drugs, in other words, okay? So, what they do, uh, and we call these non-embryonic because they, we took them from any cell in your body that's not uh, involved in sexual reproduction, you know? like the previous ones, like an embryo started out with sexual reproduction. Okay, what we do is we harvest these, uh, these uh, somatic stem cells. It says that they are differentiated. So in other words, they're partially um, down the road from being generic to something, a specific kind of tissue. They're partly along this, this timeline, okay? And we will harvest these cells and we will uh, use some chemical factors to cause them to change into whatever kind of tissue we need to uh, replace that are defective. They could become like nerve cells, they could become muscle cells, they could become bone cells, they could, so they can become different kinds of cells. So they come from tissue where it's already partially differentiated. So when we graded our assignment, remember I said that somatic cells are already down the road, so in other words, you can't use them for absolutely anything, but they're very helpful, as I think it's uh, right here, it says, we when the book was written, so this is uh, not a new book, it's an older edition, at the time the book was written, they already knew of 70 different diseases that use somatic stem cells for treatment purposes. So it's a, it's a good thing to do. Uh, now, so let's just kind of look at the two and kind of review a little bit. Uh, somatic stem cells, they come from an adult. We're considering you an adult, okay? And they would come out of you and then they would harvest them and treat them maybe with certain chemicals to stimulate them to differentiate, when we put them in, that they'll differentiate to become the kind that we want. So it's pretty easy to get them to grow and to uh, get them to differentiate. Embryonic stem cells, remember, they can come almost anything. But a downside is they also could become a tumor. So it's not, in other words, it's not a guarantee that it will always produce the results we want. And sometimes when we put them in, they fail to become the kind of cells we want them to be. You differentiate, become the kind of tissue that's going to replace uh, what we want it to replace. So that's a problem uh, if they don't always differentiate. So it's not 100% it's not successful. So uh, now we're going to use this word gene therapy not because to introduce something new in topic-wise, but to give a name for something uh, that um, we've already talked about before. Uh, 
and that is in gene therapy, what we're doing, we're trying to correct some defective gene that uh, has caused a specific disease, okay? Uh, I know that, for instance, Quentin would love to see someday that there would be gene therapy that would correct his, uh, the genes for making insulin in his islets of Langerhans so that he wouldn't have to have his insulin and his insulin pump anymore. You know, that would be nice. Uh, so what they have, they do is they're, they're going to have to take good genes that produce what we, the desired thing, then we may have to use something like a virus vector, and then we talked about that, that will take this piece of genetic information and put it into the cells that are, that have uh, the defective genes. Uh, so, you know, we talked about the, use the word recombinant gen, uh, DNA, uh, I think it was yesterday or the day before. Uh, so what they often use for that is a virus, okay? Because that's what viruses do. They, they take their own genetic code and put it into a cell and get that cell to do what it, what it wants it to. And instead of your cell making more cells of its own, it makes more viruses instead. Uh, I like to, uh, as an analogy, it would see like during war, war time, you have this factory that makes cars, you know, just making cars one after the other, and the enemy takes over and converts the code to making tanks, okay? Enemy tanks. Well, that's kind of what, what viruses do is they commandeer a cell and get it to make more viruses. Uh, viruses can't reproduce themselves, but they can get another cell to do it for them. So that, the question is, is, remember when we had talked about the characteristics of life, one is being able to reproduce themselves, is virus truly alive? It kind of fails on that one point. Also, can virus, do viruses need uh, a constant flow of energy to survive? No, right, another strike. So you're wondering, are viruses really alive in the classic sense of being alive? Now, what are some problems uh, with gene therapy? Is this isn't like a long-term solution. You would, you know, it could be at first if they did this kind of thing, let's say for Quentin, that maybe he'd have to have this done more than once. You know, it's not, good for the rest of his life, which I'm sure he didn't want that. Uh, and these viruses that we use that uh, to carry the genetic material into the cell to, to give it the correct code, uh, sometimes these viruses give us issues. Uh, and it may affect our immunity or our immunity, on, looking at it the other way, our immunity normally kills viruses, right? We try to destroy the viruses in our body. And so how are we gonna get that genetic material into a cell if our body is killing the very thing that's carrying the information? So, you know, it's not, it's not all as neat and tidy as we might like. And then what happens if I put this gene into a cell? Well, it already had genes. How will that, is it possible that it may interact with those genes and produce some undesirable results or maybe not achieve the desirable results that we want? Okay, now, new topic. DNA fingerprinting. You've probably heard that terminology. Um, what are some things that you've heard that they use DNA fingerprinting for? When you're arrested. When you're arrested. When you're arrested, there will sometimes, we think that this uh, person who's um, been accused of a crime, uh, it, we try to look to see is there any physical evidence that might tie him to the, like the crime scene, uh, you know, for instance, um, oh, if somebody, you know, let's say there was a murder, and, but 
in the process of committing the murder, we're going to see, we look at all the blood, is all the blood that's there only from the victim, or was did the victim fight back and some of the blood is actually part of the person who committed the crime? So we're going to analyze all this blood, and so I'll see if he's accused of a crime. We're going to check his DNA against the DNA that's in the blood that we found. If it matches up, then we can use that in court to, as one of the lines of evidence that this person was at least there when the crime was committed. You know, so that's, that's one of the ways that we use that for um, in court cases. Uh, another one would be um, in paternity cases. Uh, when I lived in Phoenix, I, as I would drive from school to home, I was surprised at how many different places you could actually have uh, DNA testing done. And apparently there were a lot of people having children with multiple partners, and then sometimes um, you were trying to figure out who was the father so that they'd have to pay uh, child support and stuff like that, you know. So it was complicated. So how do you prove that, you know? Uh, especially if a woman has had multiple partners. Uh, and one of the ways is through DNA testing. Take DNA from the person who's, a, who's uh, being accused of being the, I don't know if that's the right word to use, accused of being the father, the biological father, uh, and against the DNA of the child. So does the child have any DNA that's common with the father? So that would be for what we call paternity tests. You know, who's the, who's the father of this? Uh, so yeah, we can use that in many different ways. Uh, DNA testing, when it first came out, was not necessarily considered very reliable uh, because we weren't sure how confident we could be in the answers we got. But it's now anymore. Uh, there's actually cases that uh, maybe not as many now, but it, I know at first when DNA was, we were pretty confident in the results that it would give, that there would be these cold cases or cases where we weren't sure, and they would go back and compare the, the DNA stuff, you know, that they, they had collected back then, do DNA testing on it, and either clear somebody that, you know, this, this DNA we have here doesn't match the person who was accused. And some of them got released from prison because they're not guilty. Uh, but then in the process, it often, they, if it's somebody who's committed a crime, they often, people tend to commit more crimes. And so, the, and, and when you get arrested, there's a good chance they'll take some of your DNA and keep it on record on file from there on. And if, they ma if it matches up, you know, there might be somebody oh, this person's already in prison for this, and he's guilty of this crime. And, uh, you know, so the DNA testing is actually has shown to be quite reliable. Uh, it's also used in diagnosis. Remember we talked, to, uh, I think, a little bit about in this class where some uh, women who uh, have certain kinds of breast cancer, they've discovered they have a certain gene that... Uh, seems to, if you have this gene that your chances of developing breast cancer are more likely. And so uh, I remember there was one on TV just in the last year where a mother um, first uh, had uh, cancer and then I think it was like a year or two later, the daughter got breast cancer and they tested both of them, found out they both had this gene. So then the sisters that did not have breast cancer immediately said, uh, I want to be tested too to find out well, how, and it turned out, I think in that case, that all the sisters had the same gene as well. So that doesn't mean that get, you know, you're going to have breast cancer, but you need to be monitored very closely just to make sure that you're on top of that. Uh, now, the last thing we want to talk about is genetically modified plants. Um, so that's what GM stands for. Or um, you will find on food, they'll talk about GMO. You ever heard that? GMO, it stands for genetically modified organisms. Could be anything, plants, animals, whatever. Uh, 
And one of the things we've discovered about plants that we have, you know, like genetically engineered to have certain traits is that those traits tend to be superior to the original plants that we started with. Uh, now, what are some examples of some things that we know oops, to be genetically engineered? I just pushed the wrong button. Uh, is corn that we grow here is genetically engineered. Uh, and soybeans, they're both genetically engineered. They have qualities that we like. In other words, the kind of, of seed that they produce is the kinds that we like. Um, and uh, there is more, um, there is more uh, yield. We're getting close. Uh, but what is one of the things that we've been able to do with corn and soybeans is we've discovered that uh, by genetically engineering some stuff with, from, with bacteria, that the, uh, we can make corn that produces a protein that if an insect chews on this plant will kill the insect. Okay? So it's not the corn seed itself, but it's just the, the plant itself has, will, will produce a protein that if an insect eats it will kill the insect. So in other words, I don't have to spray, you know, pesticides or things like that. It will just do it, uh, kind of protect itself. Uh, what are some other things that we know? We've already done that too, also with cotton. Uh, I don't know, how many of you have ever seen cotton growing in, in real life? And, uh, you know, they harvest it. And then uh, where I lived in Oklahoma, the, top, the northern half where I lived, we just grew... We did grow corn, but you know we had uh, milo and uh, wheat uh, were probably the main things that we uh, they would grow there. They were, we would call them cereal grains. We often make those into cereals and stuff like that. But in the southern half of the state, they it was warm enough a lot of the year that you could grow cotton. You know, so the south, you know, all the way into Alabama. Alabama, Louisiana, Mississippi, you know, they can grow cotton down there. Uh, but we've also figured out how to do that same thing with them so that if they're more insect resistant because of, the, of being genetically engineered like that. Now, uh, the two primary kinds that we use where, where people are concerned about is the food part, you know, if we have to eat this. We don't care if the animals eat it. You know, as much, I suppose. But we're concerned, what if humans have to consume that? Well, we eat corn. We eat a lot of corn. And we use corn to make what? That we put in pop. Corn syrup. High fructose corn syrup. Ever heard that? Okay. Made from corn. It's a sweetener. Uh, and we use that to replace sugar. Because for a while, we were... Uh, it's kind of all started when uh, we could no longer get sugar cane from our main source, which at one time our main source was Cuba. And then we got, you know, we're no longer friends with them, and they wouldn't give, you know, rate, give us any sugar cane. Uh, so we had to have an another way of sweetening our stuff, and so we came up with high fructose corn syrup. Uh, so corn, soybeans. Um, Yes, the beans themselves can be eaten, but what else does it have? Soy, right? So uh, it's you know a food plant uh, that we use a lot. Now it turns out, uh, it's estimated that over 60% of the food that's on the grocery shelves that you and I buy and eat is that actually has genetically modified uh, plant material inside of it. In other words, it's, it's common. But uh, some people are concerned about this uh, is because this plant is not normal. In other words, it wasn't one the way God made the plant originally. 
is that possible that that's not good for us to eat that kind of plant? Now, if you kind of, to me, I think what you need to think about in this same context is who decided that this would be a good thing to eat? Just take any food that you can think of. Who does, who is the first person to try this out and find out, oh, we could eat this for food? You know, somebody had to try it out. And there's some things um, that I was kind of wondering, how did they figure that out? Like, for instance, how many of you like cashews? Okay. I like cashews. Uh, cashews is not the way, when you harvest it, if you ate cashews uh, before it's been treated, it's poisonous. So, but who figured out that if I do this to cashews, I can remove the poisonous part and actually end up with a nice, good tasting nut? Who figured that out? Um, here is uh, one thing I saw on TV um, probably about a year, year and a half ago. There's this. I can't, I don't know if you classify it as a coffee or, or tea or some kind of beverage, that there is a place in Africa where this tree grows these seed pods. And these goats uh, will, the tree kind of grows in such a way with their limbs fairly close to the ground uh, and flat that the goats will climb up on top of it and they'll eat these seed pods. But the seed uh, the seed inside of it are, is not digestible by the goat. It'll pass through there. They'll poop it out. Okay? Somebody figured out how you can collect all of these seeds that have passed through a goat and process them and grind it up and make it into a beverage that apparently a lot of people like and it's very expensive. And you can make a lot of money doing that. So you're out there chasing goats down, uh, collecting the seed pots. Who figured that out? You know, I just think about all the things that we eat. Who figured that out for the first time, you know? Who ate something that shouldn't have been used for a food and it killed them? 